Good morning. Good morning. I guess it'd be helpful if I put this on my ear so the microphone wouldn't be in my pocket. <laughs> hey, it is great to be with you. I'll tell you what, it was an awesome time of the men yesterday morning that were able to make it to the men's group. And um, I, I'm really excited about what God's doing there with us as, as a church body and especially as men in the church. And we look forward to what he has to show us in there even further down the road. So um, it's just great to be your pastor. That's what I want to tell you this morning. It's just great to um, have a family like this that loves you for who you are, because this morning is going to be a struggle for me with the sermon. Because I, I don't, number one, I don't feel qualified to share this with you because it's about the canon of scripture. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. I can, uh, I do know that part of it, but it's, it's a lot more complicated. I went down a lot of rabbit trails this week and spent hours and hours and hours of studying. And, and the challenge to that is, is that I have to give an overview up here and, and I want it to be not just informational. You know, God gives us his word to transform our lives. And, and so I don't want this to be just a lot of information that I'm giving you. The Holy Spirit doesn't want that either. He wants you to hear his voice and he wants you to understand what God has for you. So that's my prayer as we start this. Our theme this year is 101, right? Not 101, but 101, which means what? The basics. Um, that's when you go to college. The first class you take is a 101 level. Then it goes to a 201, a 301, a 401, and, and uh, et cetera. Um, but the reality here is, is that it's good to go back to the basics, even if you've been a follower of Christ for years. Because we, we tend to get off track sometimes. We tend to not always understand things. And God deals with us with different topics at different times. But right now we're working it with God's word. Okay. And we started out basically with the very first sermon was God's revelation. That God wants to speak to us. That he's, he's not up in heaven distant from us. He wants us to know him. Remember that very statement from the first sermon. God wants to know you. So he's given us creation to see there's a God. He's given us his written word, the Bible. He has given us Jesus Christ, his son, who showed us who God is, shown his love to us and accomplished all that on the cross that we could know him, God personally in a relationship. And that, that's what's key here um, with the Christian life. And let me tell you something, a lot of people miss it. A lot of people don't have that personal relationship with God. And, and, and that's what God wants for us. So we, in, in, in this series, which um, will conclude in two weeks, I think, is what I kind of got planned so far. But we're, we're learning uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 for the memory verse. And I bet you really studied that this week and you, you are all ready to go, right? Here it is. All scripture is God breathed. You can say it with me. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. OK, how, how well did you do? OK. Now, how well are you going to do? You ready? All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there it is filled in. This is the part we looked at really the last three weeks. And I want to talk about that this morning. And this is, doesn't say the same thing that does up there, so I'm struggling here. There it is. So, let, we are going to look at God's Word 101. We did Revelation. We did um, inspiration, and now we're going to do canonization or the canon of Scripture. How many of you know what that means? Don't be ashamed. Okay, good, 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 good. You will when we leave here. Okay, I know I can do that part. All right, all Scripture is God-breathed. That's the verse we're learning, right? What is that saying? That's saying that the Word of God comes from God's word, from his very mouth. We looked at the inspiration of scripture last week, and we said that, that God's word was on the lips of his prophets. And David, we looked at that passage in um, Psalms, when David talked about that. It's, it's the Lord's word on my lip. 
And, and the, there's men that God chose to write down the scriptures, and it was the words of God, but yet he used human authors to, to write them down. He didn't dictate it to them. He didn't, he didn't go, hey, write this down, blah, 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 necessarily. He, 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 but somehow God, in his infinite wisdom and ability, had the writers write the exact words that he, that he wanted to convey who he is, what his will is, what he desires of us, what he wants to do in our lives, all those things that he wants us to know. So that's why we spend time sometimes on one word of scripture going, what does this word mean? Every single word is important. And God has placed it there for us to understand it. Now, the question is, how was the content of my Bible chosen? Because that word is all scripture is God breathed. But what's scripture? How do we know what God actually said and what God didn't say? Because like with the inspiration of God, Paul wrote down two thirds of the New Testament. But I bet he also had a grocery list. Right. The grocery list wasn't inspired, but the books of the Bible are. How, how do we know what books of the Bible are truly God's word or which ones of them are man's ideas? How, how do we know that? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. So how was the content chosen for my Bible? And I don't even like the word chosen, but I'll tell you why in, in a minute. The Da Vinci Code. How many of you remember that? Remember that coming out? Everybody was crazy about the Da Vinci Code. Why? Because the Da Vinci Code said that in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, these men got together and they, they decided which books stayed in and which books went. And so they just arbitrarily said, this book here stays, this book goes. All right, there's a problem with that. The error is, is it wasn't decided in 325. And it also assumes that every book that they looked at or every scroll that they looked at was valid and could be included. <laughs> but really, um, that's one view. One view is, and if we can make it simple, it has nothing to do with the Da Vinci Code. Maybe you've talked to people that say, well, that's just a bunch of men just took a bunch of books together and decided what, what they were going to include, made it suit themselves. And then there's the other view that the completion, this is what I call the completion. Here's, here's what that is. When John got done writing Revelation, Revelation was, was generally accepted as the last book of the Bible to be written in about 80, 80, 90 AD. And when John got done writing that down, his very last pen stroke, that this Bible fell from heaven, leather bound with all of the Genesis through Revelations books in it, and the scripture, the, it was closed. There, it's all done. He did it. AD 90, we were done. We had it all finished. Well, it's not that simple. <laughs> but somewhere in between, these guys figured it out by putting in and what they wanted to put in. And God um, finishing the, the book, somewhere in between there is how it happened. And that is the canon. Well, notice it's not two ends. <laughs> the canon of Scripture right, it's, is the list. Canon means um, rule or, um, let's see, rule or the measurement, measuring stick of, of the criteria, is the measuring stick. And it, it, in the end, it becomes the canon of the Bible is the books that have been approved. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, a whole way through read to Revelation. That's what canon means. Canon means the books that are accepted as the word of God. Here's the interesting thing. Not everybody agrees on the, on the whole thing. <laughs> and we'll look at that too. But the, So you know, the word canon, it means just the accepted list of books that God wrote for us that were collected in the Bible. Okay? First, the Old Testament. The Old Testament, um, look at the scripture. Open your Bibles. I was going to get in the Bible. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't pray, and I'm going to do that right now. Lord, we thank you for um, who you are. Lord, I feel unqualified to, to share how this happened. and But Lord, at the same time, you are God. And what we're going to see is you were God, and you led, and you directed. And Father, that we can count on what you've provided to us. 
And so, Father, I pray that this morning it wouldn't just be a lot of information, but, Lord, that you would use it to transform our hearts. Lord, that you would help us to stay engaged um, with the topic this morning. Lord, that we can know and be confident that this is your word speaking to us, revealing to us word by word your will for our life. And, Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's look at Scripture for a second. I already lost it, Carson. So we're okay right now. Um, Actually, we're not. I got this. Yeah, I think. I'm going backwards, that's why. These these are backwards on here. The scripture, Joshua. Look at this. Be strong and courageous. You know that, right? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. (laughs) Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Okay, this is, this is after the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, they're the five books that are considered the law of Moses. And this is God speaking to Joshua. And he tells him, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. God himself is saying, these first five books, they're my word. And not only are you to obey them and know them, do not turn from the right or to the left. That's how you'll be successful. He goes on. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What is God telling Joshua? Joshua, know these, know these books, know what's contained in them, and don't just know it, be, obey them. And when you obey them, the result is going to be you will be prosperous and successful. Now, that doesn't just mean financially. <laughs> but God makes us prosperous in, in all kinds of ways. And, and he's telling us here that this, these five, first five books of the Bible, you can count on them. They're, they're the, my words to Moses, which is my words to you. So if we look at that, let's just take a look here how much we're talking about. I'm trying to find the beginning. This much of the Bible in Genesis, God himself is saying is trustworthy. This is, this is, God, this is my word. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, next. The Savior, what does Jesus say about the Bible? We talked about this a little bit before. He said to them, he is with the disciples. Let me catch you up. This is the end of Luke. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. He had already talked to the guys on the road to Emmaus and explained to them the scriptures and how he was contained. Remember, we said in the very beginning, the Bible's about Jesus. Old Testament and New. Old Testament's pointing to Jesus. And Jesus here is with his disciples, and he tells them, look, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses. Now we know what that is, right? First five books. The prophets. Oh, that's Ezekiel, right? Isaiah. And the Psalms. Now, now, God, now Jesus is saying, okay, you can count on not only the law of Moses, but the prophets and the Psalms. Now, here's why that's important. Because in the Hebrew Bible, it's called the Tanakh. And I like this because it's really an acronym. <laughs> Each letter stands for something. The first letter is what? T, yeah. Good, you can read Hebrew. <laughs> no, not really. It's not really Hebrew. It's true. Anyway, Torah, the law, that's another word for the Pentateuch. That's another name for Moses' law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then the Nevi'im, or something close to that. <laughs> I look for Greg for this, like he should be the one up here. Nevi'im is the prophets. That's, that's all the major prophets, but as well as the minor prophets, like you know, all those guys, um, I'm trying to trouble thinking, Obadiah, Micah, Malachi, um, all the little or smaller prophets. They don't call them small because of importance. It's the, the book that they wrote is smaller. So he's seen the prophets. 
And then he also says the Ketavim, which is the writings, which is the Psalms. So now Jesus has come along and basically said, you know, this much of it is now considered the word of God all the way up to, oh, wow. <laughs> Pretty much the whole Old Testament he's pointing to here. How much? Okay, so are you following me? So, so we, we've looked at what scripture says about it, and constantly the prophets are pointing back to the law of Moses too. He's, they're pointing back and going, okay, the, you know what testament means? Old Testament, New Testament. Testament means covenant. The covenant. And, and, and in the Old Testament, the prophets are going, okay, here's the covenant, and it says if you do this, this, and this, I will bless you. But you guys aren't even staying up with the covenant at all. You're, you're constantly... You're constantly worshiping other gods. You're constantly disobeying. You're constantly not trusting. You're constantly this far away from the from the covenant. And he's there. And the whole time, the the prophets are, are reaching back and actually actually saying that, look, this is what it says in the law, and this is where you guys are, and you're not even close. The standard. I got to remember why I had that up there for. Ah. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I've not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. See, the, the, uh, the people of Israel needed to know who to listen to, right? I, and they needed to know whether this guy was telling the truth or not, whether the prophet was sharing the true word of God, or was he just making stuff up, or was he just telling them what they wanted to hear? And so God tells him in Deuteronomy, which is what? In the first five books, right? We've already established the fact that that's God's word. Speak in my name anything I've not commanded. If it, if it, if it is contrary to what I've already told you in the scriptures, then, then he's not a true prophet. Cross him out. Or if he speaks in the name of other gods. If he tells you to worship another god, eh, cross you out, right? Next one. You may say to yourself, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? It's a little farther down in Deuteronomy. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not come true or take place, that message is not that the Lord, not what the Lord has spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so not be alarmed. You know what the you know what it was when they found out that he was um, a false prophet? What were they supposed to do with him? Put him to death. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, this will all make sense to you, I promise, as we keep going. The reality here is, is God saying, this is how you know that when the people are telling you the truth, this is how you know when they say this is the word of the Lord, that it happens, that, that, that it doesn't go against what I've already said. That's how you will understand exactly what's happening. So the Old Testament, the scripture points to it, Christ pointed to it, the standard was the prophets. We know how the prophets were evaluated. And then we go to the secondary. <laughs> this is where it gets hairy, hairier. This right here, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is four, one, two, three, four, five, five different Bibles, okay? The first one is the Jewish Tanakh. There's 24 books there. But before we get all excited, the Protestant Old Testament, that's our Bible, there's 39 core books. Do you see that? Guess what? Those 24 books are the same as our 39 books. It's just like first, we split it into First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We split it apart. And when you do that math and when you look at that, the Jewish Bible and our Bible are the same. We have the same books. Okay? Then we go to the Catholic Old Testament. Maybe you have Catholic friends. Maybe you come from a Catholic background. But you know what? Their Bible has more books than ours. Seven of them, to be exact. Tobit, Sirach, Judith, Barak, First and Second Maccabees, and Wisdom. So they have seven more books than we have. Now, why is that? <laughs> With also, in addition to, you can't read it, but that's what it says, in addition to Daniel and Esther. They have two extra chapters in Daniel. Is that right? Two, two or three, two or one, one, two or three. They got a couple extra. 
Okay. Then we go to the orth, and I'll tell you why in a second. Then we go to the Orthodox Old Testament, and they have the 39 core books. They have the addition to Daniel and Esther, and they also have uh, Psalm 151 and the prayer of Manasseh in their Bible. And then they have the what's called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical books, Tobit, Sirach, Judith, Barak, First and Second Mac- Maccabees, and Wisdom. Then they've also added First and Second Esdras, Third Maccabees, and, and as an appendix, Fourth Maccabees. Then we go to the Ethiopian Old Testament. And there's 40 core books there, and they 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 threw out First and Second Maccabees, and they are okay with First and Second Estratus, but not Third Maccabees. And then down at the bottom, they have a one to three Maccabean Jubilees, Enoch, Fourth of Baruch, and whatever that last one is. I can't half read it. So so what's going on here? <laughs> You want me to tell you that, right? <laughs> You're all listening so far. That's good. Um, let me see if I can I can help you out with this. The Protestants say that the Bible, I should really get my notes out because I don't want to misspeak here. Um, wherever they are. I can't find them again this week. Why do I write stuff down? <laughs> Wait, maybe this is it. Come on, get me out of my get me out of the hole I dug. All right, the apocrypha. We're just going to talk about this morning the difference between the Protestant Bible and the Catholic Bible, because that's you're probably going to run into that a whole lot more than you are the Orthodox or the Ethiopian Bible. Before I started studying this, I had no idea there was an Ethiopian Bible, and I had no idea really that the Orthodox Old Testament was different. Um, we call it the apocrypha. The Protestants do. The, um, which means uncertain or obscure. And the Catholics um, call, their, call it a, deutero, a deuterocanonical, which means the second canon, um, because they were accepted a little bit later. Um, full status in 1546. But these books, the, the, the difference is these books were never accepted by the Jews. So when we look at the Old Testament, it's about, a testament, it's about Israel, and, and we say, well, that's not God's word. And here's another reason why. Most of them were in, remember when I had Ed come up front, and he was Dr. Luke, and I told him to start at the beginning, and he started reading, and I said, what are you doing, Ed? You're, or what are you doing, Luke? <laughs> um, that's not what it says. That's not the beginning. Start with Jesus, and it starts with John the Baptist. Remember, well, at the end of Malachi, it, it talks about um, the prophet Elijah coming. Okay, and there was 400 years of silence in there between the Old Testament and the the New Testament. 400 years of silence, okay? Even as I studied this, I learned that even even, even the Jews realized that there was 400 years of silence. Why? Because there were no prophets. So if there's no prophets, there must not be any God's word coming right now. However, these books... Tobit, Sirach, Judith, Barak, First and Second Maccabees, and Wisdom are basically accepted as books that were written between the end of Malachi and the, and the New Testament. You understand what I'm saying? That's why we have said, well, I'm not too sure about this. Now, let me tell you something. These books, Christians have disagreed. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting Catholics and Protestants together. Christians have disagreed whether these should be included or not. And, 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 and the standpoint of the Protestant is, look, no, it's, it's doesn't come from there. But look, we don't just throw them out. Listen to this. They are good books. If you want to know what happened between the 400 years in the 400 years of silence, it tells us how the how the Pharisees came about. You know, they just show up in the New Testament. The Sadducees it shows how they came about. Now, it's not God's word. OK, we, we're not putting it on the same level as Scripture. But it's kind of like Josephus or any other thing that's written. It gives us insight into what the Jews were thinking. Do you follow me? Like Josephus, we can read the things of Josephus. So it's not God's word. He, he didn't record it for that purpose. That's not what he was a historian. He's writing it down. It helps us understand what's happening in the Bible, but it's not equated with the word of God. And if I could just go one step farther to get myself in even more trouble is in... Here's the deal with canon. The deal with canon is the job of the church with the canon. The canon was um, 
accepted over a long time period. Okay, the Old Testament would stop being written in the 400s, BC, or um, yeah, BC, and they they battle the the Jews were always comfortable. Like this is what this is what we believe God's word is, and um, during that 400 years of silence, they said this is this is the word of God. Not not a problem there. I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> Left the station. Hold it. Give me a second. <laughs> oh, the job of the, of the church was to discover which books are God's word. That's the canon, the standard. Okay, they were they weren't supposed to to um, make it God's word. Okay, they weren't supposed to establish it as God's word. They were supposed to recognize it or discover what God had written for it. Do you see the difference? And and part of the difference with with the um, the apocrypha, the additional books, the seven books we're talking about, is is the Protestants put their authority on the Word of God, right? The, the it tends the the Catholicism tends to put the the emphasis on the authority of the Church, right? So so they're more apt to yeah, okay. So what 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 are we going to talk about? How's this going to be? They they more or less um, establish the book. And, and, and we more or less as Protestants say, let's discover what's the book. Which, which ones were truly God's word? I see you're all going, huh? It's all right. <laughs> just, just know they're different, okay? If you, only, if you don't walk away with anything else, just know they're different. And why they're different is, is because we, we kind of went with the Jews and said, no, we agree these are, these, are, these are books we can learn from, but they're not God's word. They don't make the standard. And when I get to the New Testament, it'll make more sense, I think, I hope. Here's the neat thing. The New Testament, we all agree on it. <laughs> Matthew all the way through Revelation. Okay? And the Old Testament's important. I don't want to say it's not important, but isn't it great that we all agree on the New Testament? How many books are in your Bible, by the way? 66. How many are in the Old Testament? 39. How many in the New Testament? Do your math quick. 27. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're hanging good. You're doing good. All right, let's look at the New Testament. So just know there's a difference. Like, that's all I'm trying to tell you. But I'm trying to give you the insight here of what I thought happened was is that some people finally decided what, what was going to be considered God's word and what wasn't. And reality is more of they fought with it. They wrestled with it. It took them a while to accept Hebrews. We don't know what Hebrews, we, we, don't, we don't know who wrote Hebrews 100%. Well, Revelation was all these images, and they're like, I don't know whether John even wrote that or not. And I'm trying to give you confidence here that the church leaders got together in all these different conferences throughout the years. And they, and they argued for their point. They, they tried to discover, okay, which ones of these did God write? And by the Holy Spirit, they, they were in, in, um, impacted or impressed by each one as to whether it is in the canon or not. So it wasn't one guy's decision. It wasn't one church's decision. It was the church at large. And I'll help you with that when we get to the New Testament. All right. The comment. <laughs> I love this part. You, you'll connect with this. I guarantee it. Bear in mind that our Lord's patient means salvation. I'm in 2 Peter, so Peter wrote this. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So now Paul's saying, hey, these letters Paul wrote, they have some substance to them, right? It, it, that God gave them to him, and I love this. He, meaning Paul, writes the same way in all his letters. Speaking in them of these matters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. <laughs> I love that. Peter, an apostle, goes, when I read Paul's letters, I'm scratching my head, man. They are deep. They are, they are incredible. They contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures. So Peter's saying they're scripture too, Right. Let me tell you that the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were hardly ever disputed. They, they pretty much accepted them right away, and I'll, I'll show you why. The criteria. This is the test that they use. And they said, and they said when we're trying to figure this canon out, 
the, the list of acceptable books, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're, going to, we're going to use these tests and discover which ones are really God's word. And this is key, this first one. Does it have apostolic authority? Boy, that's a nice word, an apostolic authority. Does anybody know what that means? Don't raise your hand. I'm going to help you. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. This is after Jesus is resurrected. He ascends into heaven, and the disciples are left there. we got disciples and apostles. I'm going to explain the difference. Those present, the apostles, were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, and Judas. How many is that? Eleven. Where did the twelfth one go? Who was it? Judas, right. And they're going to replace Judas. And, and, and God had, had uh, Jesus had made them apostles, and we're going to see why here. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. That's, that's part of what it means to be apostle. You were with Jesus when he was on earth walking, and you were there from, with the, from the beginning, and here's the other criteria. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a what? Witness with us of his resurrection. So an apostle is one who walked with Jesus. He is one who saw the resurrected Jesus, right? That's why we have so much confidence in Matthew and John. <laughs> Wait a minute. Am I going backwards? I think I am. John's name's up there, right? Matthew's name's up there. What about Mark and Luke? They weren't apostles. But they were so, the, the apostles, that's why it says, a, a, a pop, what is it? Apostolic authority. They were worked so closely related, like Luke looked at eyewitnesses. This is we're talking about eyewitnesses here that saw Jesus that went. And Luke, Luke was in that group because of that. And that's why it's not just the apostle had to write it, it had to have apostolic authority. Okay, does that make any sense? So if you're thinking, you should say, well, wait a minute. Where's Paul in all this? Paul says he's an apostle. <laughs> he is. But he says, I was an apostle born at a time. But he saw the resurrected Christ, did he not, on the road to Damascus, or on the road to Damascus, right? He saw the resurrected Christ. So that's why Paul's canon. Now, if you figure out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then we got Paul's 15 letters. There's only 27 books in the New Testament. That's quite a bit, right? Quite a bit's already taken care of with that. So you had to be an apostle or approved by the apostles that, that you have the authority of apostles. That you understand what I mean. The next thing they looked at was content. That wasn't enough. This is where the, the books, the gospel of Judas and the gospel of Thomas got kicked out. You've heard of them, right? Everybody's all upset. The gospel of Thomas comes along. Gospel of Judas. What about them? Why aren't they included? Because their content did not agree with the the content of the Gospels or what they had previously. So, so really what we're saying is just like in the Old Testament, the prophet, they knew whether if it, if it, if it coincided with God's word, it was true. If it didn't, it, it wasn't true. They kind of use that same thing with content. How does it look with the group? Does, does it match or are there problems with it? Does it teach the same thing? And then the last one seems kind of a funny one, but it's widely accepted. Did the church use it as the word of God? See, I know. Isn't this, isn't this confusing? Like, this is like, <laughs> what do we do with this? Yeah, it's like college, isn't it? See, now you know why my prayer was, is that I don't want you to just like gloss over here and go, what the heck is going on here? How did this happen? But here's the reality. The reality is that God took this whole process. And, and the people that were looking this said, if in doubt, throw it out. If in doubt, we're, we're getting rid of it. It's not going to even be on the, on the table. If it, if it doesn't match, we're going to throw it out. If it does, 
they weren't really making the decision. I hope you understand that part of it. That's why I don't like the word, how are the books of these chosen? They weren't really chosen. They were God's word before they ever discovered it was God's word. It was either God's word or it's not. doesn't matter whether they chose to accept it as God's word or not, right? But that's how we got our Bible, <laughs> which I thought was really simple until I started to look at it. And I'm like, oh, there's all these councils and they meet together. And one time this is in and one time it's out. And this time it's over here. And it's, I was like, what the world is going on here? How did we get our Bible? And I've come down to the conclusion that God made it so that we would recognize who is what, what his books are. <laughs> and he threw out the other ones. And in 397, we got the official list, finally, of the New Testament and the Old Testament books. And that's where we landed. Now, if they discover another book, <laughs> would have to be written way back then, right? 2,000 years ago. Couldn't be something new. When we read something like, this is another testament of Jesus Christ. There is no other one. This is the last one. The closing. I didn't have that up there, did I? The canon's been closed. <laughs> the canon's been closed. Meaning that, that with the end of Malachi and the end of the New Testament by, by um, 170, they, they'd said, you know, the Old Testament's done. The prophets stopped 400 B.C., there weren't any prophets in between there. So that's the Old Testament. That's God's word. There can't be another book. Then, then they, they looked at the New Testament writings and they said, oh, here's the apostles. Of course they knew Jesus. We can trust what they've got. And it, it, it agrees all the way around. There's really no argument with that. Well, then Paul too, you know, he was an apostle. And if you look at Galatians, Ephesians, and all those, he's saying Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, so if he's an apostle, it has apostolic authority. So that's 90%, 85% of your New Testament without even a question, really. Although it was questioned and it was very, um, it was very um, specifically critiqued and taken a look at it. The closing, I don't know why that's not up there. Anyway, here's what, here's what it says. All right, what do we do with all this? <laughs> What did God say to me today? I don't know. I was like, Scott, I have no idea where you were going. Like, what, what is happening here? Would you open your books, your Bibles to 2 Peter? I think I'll start there. You have to look at this because I don't have this on the screen. 2 Peter. It's back behind Hebrews in front of 1 John. We looked at this verse a couple weeks ago. Second Peter chapter one, verse 19. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it. <laughs> as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. This was not a thing designed by man. This was God at work. And he said it would do well if you pay attention to the reliable word that you have. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, all Scriptures God breathed, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's really how we got our Bible. <laughs> we got our Bible by the Holy Spirit working in the lives of people to recognize what God had written down for us as his word. You know, when you're talking about, remember, you're talking about scrolls. You're, you're not talking about this, <laughs> right? There was a scroll for Isaiah. There was a scroll for Ezekiel. Not everybody had all the scrolls. So it, it took a while to bring all that together and figure out, okay, God, which ones of these have you written? And it just took some time, which also tells us that God, when he does things, takes time. <laughs> he takes time in our life as well. And so you're reading in Psalms right now in, in the study guide, right? That whole Psalm talks about the importance of the word of God. 
It's not really trying to defend it. We talked about that last week with the Charles Spurgeon um, quote. The Bible is not something that needs to be defended. It's like a lion. You just let the lion out of the cage and it can defend itself. So don't be afraid that what you have in your hands is a thing of men that they just threw together and thought this is it. No, God was a part of every bit of that. And he has it down for us and it's reliable and we can trust it. The question is, are we reading it and are we using it? That's what Psalm 119 is all about. Psalm 119, I, I'm just going to, I know. Give me just one more second. Well, not a second, but one more minute. Listen to what it says. My soul faints with longing for your salvation. The, the, the psalmist is going, man, I am waiting on you, Lord, and it is taking a long time. But look what he says. But I have put my hope in your word. See, this is not just, this is just not just something. This is not a man's idea. This is the word of God. And he's saying there that I've been waiting you for a long time, Lord, but here's what I've done. I put my hope in your word. My eyes fail looking for your promise. When will you comfort me? Verse 83, though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. Over and over again, the psalmist is saying how the word of God impacts his life how the word of God gives him direction, how the word of God makes him smarter than his teachers, how the word of God works in his life. And whether you know how canon was made or how any of that stuff is not the important thing, really. What we have is reliable. These guys that did a, wrote a book, this is what they say about the Bible. No Christian confident in the providential working of God. See, providential working of God, him bringing it together, him revealing it and informed about the true nature of canonicity of his word, the true nature, how it was done. No Christian should be disturbed about the dependability of the Bible we now possess. And what we have is God's word. The question is, are we relying on it? Let me tell you something. This world we're living in is a mess. Now, if you haven't figured that out yet. And, and we are in a spot in our world where the Bible's being discounted, where Christianity's being discounted, where we're being thrown off to the side. And we've got to get in here and get our answers because every day what we're getting is the world's ideas. And, and so what did God say to me today? You'll have to answer that question. But this right here, I am convinced after all this mess, all this week, that this is the true word of God and it can defend itself. If you don't believe that, that's okay with me. You get in there and check it out. <laughs> You'll wrestle with it. I'll tell you that you will wrestle with it, but that's all right. Because the Bible and, and Christianity does not have to run the other direction when we have questions. Okay. We don't have to run the other way. <laughs> it's it, God can handle it. <laughs> he can handle our questions. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of knowing you and, Lord, this was a heavy thing, and this was a, a difficult thing, but God, the bottom line is all Scripture is God-breathed. And we thank you, Lord, that you have recorded it for us, and that you have, you have guided and, and by your Holy Spirit convicted men of, of the, the um, authenticity of your Word. And what we have is a reliable book in front of us that tells us how we, how we have life, and have life more abundantly. It tells us how Christ came and died for our sin. It tells us how we can have eternal life. It tells us how we can live in this world that we're living in. Lord, it tells us all these things that we need for life and godliness. And yet, Lord, we confess that we don't always do the hard work of, of struggling through it. Lord, we confess that it's not always part of our diet. Lord, we confess that sometimes we are shaken by things that other people say. But Lord, we're grateful this morning that your word is fall, flawless, that it is truth, that it has been recorded for us. And we go all the way back to that first message so that we can know you. God, you are so awesome. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for um, preserving your word that we might depend upon it. The Lord, when you say it's going to happen, it happens. And we've seen that. We've seen the trustworthiness of Scripture in our own lives. If we've been a believer very long and we've been studying it, 
Lord, we see how faithful you really are. And so, Lord, help us today to, to be confident. We started out with confidence becoming for, through your throne of grace. Why do we have that confidence? We have that confidence because your word tells us that Christ paid for our sin, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need. Lord, we may not understand what canon is, but we do understand that the word of God is sharper than an any two-edged sword. It's able to go to the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Lord, it can get down to the nitty gritty. And we thank you that we have people around us like the men's group yesterday and people sitting here right now this morning. Lord, that we can wrestle through these things. And the Lord, that the, the Bible can defend itself. Lord, thank you and we praise you and we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.